Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. The 2016 Prophetic Year in Review, Part 2. Fifty years ago, Robert Kennedy said in a speech, there's a Chinese curse which says, may ye live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. 1966 was an interesting and dangerous time, but 2016 exceeded it all. At the beginning of the year, Anne Grand Lotz, Billy Graham's daughter, said, I can feel the encroaching darkness of evil that is like a heavy moral and spiritual fog. It's permeating our nation at every level. With those words, she expressed something that people not just in America, but all over the world felt last year. And with good reason. 2016 was certainly an interesting year. It was the year of Russia's resurgence as a major influence on global politics. It was also the year of Donald Trump. Not even president in 2016, he dominated news across the world. It was the year of Brexit and fake news, mass migrations and terror. Email played a surprising role in global politics. New technologies again seemed tailor-made to fulfill the prophecies of Antichrist. Two weeks ago, we looked at 2016 in the light of God's prophetic time clock, Israel. This week, we'll look at the rest of the world. In 2016, Russia again openly threatened nuclear war harassed U.S. vessels and stepped into the vacuum created by U.S. disengagement in the Middle East. Russia participated in naval drills with the Philippines. Russian President Vladimir Putin deployed short-range ballistic missiles to Kaliningrad, a region that sits directly between Poland and Lithuania. The U.S. State Department said the move is destabilizing to European security. In November, Russia successfully tested new trains that work as mobile nuclear launch platforms. Each train carries six RS-24 Yars missiles. Each missile carries four 250 kiloton warheads and has a range of 6,800 miles. That puts Europe and the United States within range. In December, Putin spoke publicly of Russia's new nuclear armament push. He said, we need to strengthen the military potential of strategic nuclear forces, especially with missile complexes that can reliably penetrate any existing and prospective missile defense system. Just one day earlier, Russia successfully tested the new PL-19 Nudal missile. The PL-19 is a satellite killer. That's significant because much of the amazing capability of the U.S. and the NATO forces depend on communications and global positioning satellites. What's Russia's end game? Mark Snyder of the National Institute for Public Policy made this assessment. He said, Russia is getting ready for a big war, which they assume will go nuclear, with them launching the first attacks. The July coup d'etat attempt in Turkey precipitated a massive and violent response from Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The Turkish president had already been pushing his nation away from its long tradition of secularism and toward a Muslim theocracy. The attempted coup put him and his agenda in an even more powerful position. One of the most significant events of 2016 is that the government of Turkey moved even closer to becoming a radical Islamic regime. 
remember that Turkey is not just any nation. It's a member of NATO with a highly strategic location, a large economy, and a powerful military. Late in 2015, Turkey shot down a Russian Su-24 attack aircraft during a border dispute between the two nations. Putin called it a stab in the back. On December 19th of 2016, Andrei Karlov, the Russian ambassador to Turkey, was assassinated in Ankara. Normally, either one of these events, the assassination of a major diplomat or the shooting down of a military aircraft, would have been enough to cause a long-term rift in Russian-Turkish relations. But in 2016, something else was at work. The two ancient enemies actually seemed to be forming an alliance. In 2015, Russia and Iran became strong allies. The beginning of the highly destructive alliance foretold in Ezekiel 38. In 2016, Turkey began the process of joining that alliance. Normally, for Russia to make an alliance with the Shiite Iran would have been seen as a threat by Sunni Turkey. The 1,300-year-old blood feud between these two competing Islamic factions usually defines the military and the political alliance of the region. But Russia is somehow bridging the ancient divide. It doesn't fit logically or historically, but it does fit prophetically. Ezekiel 38 describes an alliance that not only includes Russia and Iran, but several regions within modern-day Turkey. Other parts of that alliance also seem to be coming into Russia's orbit. Ezekiel 38 describes Russia leading these nations in a massive and ultimately doomed invasion of Israel during the last days. The United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. The result of that referendum is widely known as Brexit. That's an abbreviated reference to British exit from the EU. Immediately after the vote, we learn that a new super European Union is in the works. The new version looks a lot like the revived Roman Empire described in Bible prophecy. The Express of London reported the foreign ministers of France and Germany are due to reveal a blueprint to effectively do away with the individual member states in what is being described as an ultimatum. Under the radical proposals, EU countries will lose the right to have their own army, criminal law, taxation system, or central bank, with all these powers being transferred to Brussels. With a blueprint to effectively do away with individual member states and control of a continent-wide European army, we're talking about a world power of the first order. It could fit the Bible's description of the Antichrist European power base. The Muslim invasion of Europe hit a new high in 2016. The ramifications have only begun to manifest themselves. They will last for decades or forever. They have already profoundly altered global politics, not to mention the day-by-day -day lives of Europeans. A 2016 study shows that for every 100 girls 16 and 17, Sweden now has 123 boys of the same age. That's significantly worse than China's disastrous predicament in which boys outnumbered girls because of selective abortions and the country's one-child policy. But in Sweden, the disparity comes as a result of immigration from the Middle East. Massive numbers of young Islamic men have been entering Europe but relatively few of the helpless women and children portrayed in the media. One UN study showed that 72% of the refugees have been men, 15% children, and only 13% women. 
Notice how the mainstream media gives the opposite impression. From the images on our TV screens, you would think only vulnerable women and their children had been crossing into Europe. Several years ago, sociologists Valerie Hudson and Andrea Den Boer wrote a book for MIT Press called Bare Branches. The book described the dangers of China's male-to-female ratio at the time. Their studies found that societies with large numbers of unattached males show a dramatic increase in violent crime. History says that nations with high numbers of such individuals are more likely to engage in aggressive military action abroad. That has always been our concern about China. Sweden's male to female ratio is significantly worse than what these scholars were warning about in China. Massive numbers of young men leaving their countries also does irreparable harm to the nations they, they're leaving. They are the labor force needed to rebuild war-ravaged lands. Are the military-aged men needed to protect it? But they move to Europe where they're often unemployed, frustrated, and angry. They're certainly not all terrorists, but few of them will ever be assimilated. They bring with them the roots of the very evil they say they're fleeing. German politician Frauke Petri summed up the new situation in her country. Germany is no longer safe. Because of this, a dangerous backlash is growing. In 2016, Hitler's Mein Kampf returned to the bestseller list, 91 years after it was written. These lessons also apply to the United States. In a recent book, CIA contractor James Mitchell wrote that under interrogation, notorious terror leader Khalid Sheikh Mohammed said that the terror attacks were good, but the practical way to defeat America was through immigration and by outbreeding non-Muslims. Mitchell quotes Sheikh Mohammed as saying, eventually, America will expose her neck to us for slaughter. Jesus said that near the end of the age, nation will rise against nation. It's important to understand that the Greek word translated nation is ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic. Jesus wasn't speaking here about countries rising against one another, though he also predicted that. In this instance, he was talking about people groups banding together against other people groups. The migrant crisis in Europe has different European ethnic groups rising up against one another across the continent. In 2016, nationalism exploded into mainstream European politics. We also saw it in the United States. The American melting pot showed signs of resegregation. Black Lives Matter is a good example. Recently, the Wall Street Journal said, from Brexit to Trump to the rise of nationalist parties across Europe, the old division between left and right is giving way to a battle between self-styled patriots and confounded globalists. But globalism also made major inroads in 2016. I pointed out in last year's Prophetic Year in Review how world trade agreements are creating governments higher than those of the nations which form the alliances. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, is the worst of these so far. It seems illogical to think that there could be a simultaneous rise in both nationalism and globalism. But that's what the Bible predicted for the end times, and that is what's happening right now in 2016. The persecution of Christians continued unabated last year, but with little notice from the world's elites. The United States took in about 11,000 Syrian refugees during the year. 
only 56 of the 11,000 were Christians. Even though the U.S. Congress and the U.N. have officially declared that what's happening to the Christians in Syria is genocide. Jesus said that in the last days we would face persecution. Our brothers and sisters are facing it right now. The Bible also talks about a time when many will cease to preach sound doctrine. Last year, Pope Francis accused Donald Trump of not being Christian because the candidate wants to build a wall along the U.S. border of Mexico. The Bible says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not as a result of works. But according to this Pope, you are saved by holding the right political views. In December, he declared that those who resist his reforms within the Catholic Church are inspired by the devil. Friends, we're not redeemed by our political views, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have entered a new era of lawlessness where crime is not just suffered on urban streets, but in small towns, in corner offices, and in the halls of government. Lawlessness exploded in 2016, partly because respect for law enforcement officers hit a new low. 2016 was a hard year for the police. An alarming number of law enforcement officers were targeted and assassinated. Jesus warned that lawlessness would be a hallmark of the last days of this age. The dominant social networking and computer software companies, especially Facebook, Twitter, and Google, have created amazing avenues of expression to the masses. In doing so, they have also become the gatekeepers of communication. And they have each signaled that in the future, they will place more and more restrictions on the public expression of ideas. Their excuse is that they want to stop hate, terror, and something called fake news. Unfortunately, this is a real thing. There are people whose gimmick is to invent false stories and present them as though they were true. Their goal is to lure interested viewers to visit particular websites so that they can sell paid advertisement. But more and more, the label fake news is being used against any ideas that differ from left-wing academic and political orthodoxy. Publish an argument critical of man-made climate change and it will be labeled fake news. Regardless of the author's academic credentials, every year the United Nations sponsors a meeting on climate change called a Conference of the Parties. They abbreviate this and add a number to it to denote each event. In 2015 in Paris, it was COP21. Last year, it was held in Marrakesh and called COP22. The official COP22 website recently ran a story that bragged in its headline, Climate Deniers Late with Trump's EPA Pick Booted from COP22 Talks. So if you disagree with the orthodox position, you're not allowed to be a part of the conference. Even if you represent the leader of the world's largest economy and most influential nation, there can be no discussion, no dialogue, and no opportunity to persuade. Either you toe the line or you get the boot. Also, notice that those who disagree are no longer labeled climate change deniers, but just climate deniers. Dictionary.com defines climate as the composite or generally prevailing weather conditions of a region. No one denies climate. That would be like denying air. But you can see what's happening. Quick labels have replaced thoughtful discussion 
making the world ever more vulnerable to something I'll talk about in a moment. The great scourge of the last days, deception. On last year's prophetic review, I discussed the superbug apocalypse. It remains a major threat to mankind. Last week, one of these infections killed a woman in Nevada. It's a bacteria resistant to all known antibiotics. 2016 also saw North Korea become even more dangerous to the world. China's growing belligerence and aggression, turmoil in Central and South America, including the pending collapse of Venezuela and the death of Fidel Castro. We could do a month of programs on terrorism and only scratch the surface. 2016 was a year when a wave of occult practices touched America as perhaps never before. A massive opioid epidemic swept the United States and much of the world. All of this fulfills Bible prophecy for, to a T. To understand the rise of the occult in 2016 and so many other of the year's events, we need to understand deception and delusion. Jesus began his Matthew 24 teaching on the last days with the words, take heed that no one deceives you. 2 Corinthians 11 warns of false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. But more terrible than the deceit of man is the judgment of God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 speaks of the end times when it says, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie. The context shows that the lie referred to here is a belief that the Antichrist is God. We who are in Christ will have been raptured by the time Antichrist does his worst. But to understand our world today, we must understand that it is moving fast toward Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God's judgment against those who choose lies over truth is to give them over to the delusion of those lies. He gives them what they choose. This will come to fruition at the time the Antichrist reveals himself, but the people of the planet are already on that road. During that destination, Jesus compared the time of his return to the time of Noah and Lot. In Lot's day, people celebrated perversion just like today, and God judged Sodom. In Noah's day, they celebrated violence just like today, and God judged the whole world. But in both of those cases, the Lord made provision for those who turned to him. Lot was not in Sodom when the fire fell from the sky. God moved him to a place of safety. In the same way, God placed Noah safely in the ark before the flood rose. If you are in Christ, you will be raptured to safety before God's wrath falls on the world. In the meantime, here we are in the midst of the world being engulfed by darkness. Earlier, I quoted Ann Graham Lotz Speaking of an encroaching of evil, she went on to say, at the very same time that our nation is enveloped in thick darkness, God commands us to arise, let our light shine, and the distinctive glory of our Lord will be obvious to all. 
Times of darkness represent the greatest opportunities for spreading the light of Christ. That's what 2017 is about for us here at the Hal Lindsey Report. And I pray that it expresses your heart's deepest desire as well. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call one 888 rapture.